Okay, we might make a start, folks. We've got um, quite a few people uh, joining us online, which is terrific. Um, first of all, um, I would just like to acknowledge that here in Sydney, uh, at the offices of the Australia Council, we are on the Gadigal lands of the people of the Eora Nation, and I pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging, and I also welcome uh, all First Nations people who are joining us on this call today, uh, and certainly those who work day to day with me in the office. Um, thanks everyone. We're just going to quickly introduce ourselves um, so you know who's who. Uh, my name is Andy Donovan. I'm the Director of Multi-Year Investment here at the Australia Council with responsibility um, for the four-year uh, investment uh, organisations program, uh, as well as um, a range of other multi-year investment uh, relationships that we have across the Australia Council. And I'm joined uh, by some of my esteemed colleagues uh, from our team of heads of practice. Uh, Zoha, perhaps you'd like to introduce yourself. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Zoha Spatz. I um, am dialing in from the lands of the Yagara and the Turrbal people in Brisbane. Um, I am the head of community and experimental art practice, so covering off two different art forms. Um, and I am wearing a brown dress with blue collars. I've got short brown and blonde hair, and I've got some ginormous brown circular earrings in that make me feel happy. Thanks, Zoha. Sarah. Hello, my name is uh, Sarah Greentree. I'm the head of dance and multi-arts here at the Australia Council. I'm calling in from Wurundjeri country here in Melbourne, Nam. Um, I've got longish brown flyaway hair and a big pair of thick glasses. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, and uh, also Trish. Hello, everyone. I'm Trish Ajay, head of First Nations Arts and Culture at Australia Council. For the arts. Um, I, I'm Wathathi and Mabiok Islander from the Torres Strait um, that live here on Gadigal Country in Sydney and I'm wearing a navy dress. Um, I've got brown skin and um, black sort of curly hair in a bun and I've got um, studs that have navy and pink and green on them. Thanks. Terrific, thanks Trish and I should add uh, that I'm wearing a green jacket a white shirt, I've got my reading glasses on, uh, and I've got um, a tuft of grey hair um, that is quite prominent uh, on my rather unkempt head at the moment. Um, look, thanks everyone. We um, uh, really appreciate the fact that there's a lot of people here, um, and um, there's probably a people with a lot of questions as well. And um, hopefully you've all had a chance uh, to look at the guidelines um, I'm just going to share my screen for a moment just to um, just to take us through what we're doing today and I hope this works properly. Um, I thought I had the PowerPoint screen up just a sec folks. Okay, so what we're going to do is just a quick uh, run through of the four year uh, investment guidelines, touch on the timelines. Um, also just introduce uh, the full list of heads of practice um, um, who are obviously going to be very helpful in um, guiding people through some of this process. And then we'll also have um, time for some Q&A. Now, of course, um, in this Zoom call, um, there is a QA and a um, facility. So as we go through, uh, if you've got questions, please um, do um, put them into the, into the Q&A. There's also a chat facility. Um, so it'd be great too, if you wanna just say hi uh, and uh, and just give a shout out from whichever um, First Nations lands you are on uh, around the country too, um, which would be great as well. Um, but we'd prefer if you could keep the questions to that Q&A box, just so we can manage um, the questions as they flow through from you. Um, uh, so try to avoid putting them in the chat box. We'll keep our eye on it, but um, we'd prefer if you could use the Q&A Q box. Um, so the, um, the guidelines, as you'll see them on the website, um, uh, appear here. Um, and obviously we're talking about expressions of interest for four-year investment today. Um, and you'll notice too in the guidelines that we also acknowledge um, that 
Um, there's been a great deal of um, changes in the operating environment since the last uh, four-year four investment uh, round. Uh, and you probably have also noticed that we've changed the name of the category to four-year investment from four-year funding. Um, and we just wanted to acknowledge that and also acknowledge that there's obviously, um, you know, still a, a lot of ramifications from uh, the last couple of years and the pandemic and the disruption that that has caused. Uh, and we also want to acknowledge that this process um, for four-year investment is also, um, you know, a fairly, um, a fairly contested one. There's lots of applications and expressions of interest that we'll receive. Uh, and so we also want to acknowledge that, um, um, you know, it's, it's, it's quite an effort and um, 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 it can be quite, uh, cause some anxiety for people out in the sector too, in terms of the application. So we try to make it um, as simple as we can, but we completely understand uh, that, it is, um, uh, that it is a challenging process for people. Um, you'll note there are a few changes in the way we sort of talk about four-year investment category um, um, for 25 to 28. Um, I guess the principle behind the multi-year investment category for us is providing investment for arts and cultural organisations, uh, enabling organisations to plan with longer term certainty uh, and increase their capacity to leverage other support and collaborations. So what we're really looking for through the four-year investment uh, expressions of interest uh, are companies that can present us with a compelling four-year vision for the period 25 to 28. And I think when we talk about that notion of a four-year vision uh, or a four-year artistic vision, if you like, we're really looking at, um, I guess, the progression of that vision through, that, through, that, through those four years. So kind of where you start uh, and where you aim to finish in terms of that vision uh, over those four years. Um, you'll also note uh, we have um, sort of really tried to emphasise that what we're looking to uh, invest in through four-year investment is the small to medium sector. So organisations that can be quite small and that really, um, you know, rely on four-year investment um, to, to operate and present um, compelling art to the Australian community. Um, just in terms of the funding that can be requested, uh, the minimum eligible grant request for the program is 100,000 per year, uh, and the maximum request per year is 520,000. So that means over the course of four years, uh, the maximum total investment is $2,080,000, um, and obviously 400,000 in total for those uh, that apply for uh, that, the lower end of that, um, of that range. Um, I am not, is there any quick Q and questions coming in yet? Um, yes, okay, great. Um, I'm just having a quick look at those. We will um, come to those uh, in a moment. So thanks, Jessica, for those questions. Um, and um, uh, we will get to those points in a moment. Um, I just wanted to touch on um, uh, the timelines. Um, for it. And of, of course, I'm not going to go through those guidelines in a whole bunch of detail. I really encourage you to sort of um, have a look at them. There'll be other webinars that we're doing uh, over the course of the um, or course of the next few weeks as well. So if you um, haven't had a chance to look at the guidelines yet and want to um, want to get in touch uh, with us uh, or come along to another webinar with some questions, then, then please do. Um, but I guess importantly, um, we're still looking at um, uh, in terms of those, uh, in terms of those guidelines, um, sort of the the artistic vision is what the expressions of interest will be looked at, um, and um, uh, and that kind of is, forms the basis of the of the application. There's not really any um, um, need to submit a strategic plan at the point of the expression of interest. Um, but we certainly are conscious and aware that um, many organisations will be sort of working on that and thinking about that um, in the lead up to the expression of interest. Uh, and then, of course, um, if you get through that expression of interest process in the lead up to the, uh, the application that comes in later in 2023. Um, just to touch on the timelines. Um, so you can see now that we've got the application uh, and the guidelines are available on the website. Um, in February on the 14th is the closing date for those expressions of interest. Um, we anticipate that in early June, we will notify about the outcomes uh, of the EOI uh, and invite those that have um, 
uh, got through that process to make a full application to us with a closing date uh, of that application, full application in August. Um, decisions then will be notified uh, in 2023 in December, uh, and then we'll work with uh, companies um, that get through that process um, around the issuing of contracts of 25 to 28. Uh, and the reason we're doing it um, uh, in advance, really, is so that so that all organisations uh, um, by 2024 will know um, where they sit, I suppose, in terms of the four-year investment uh, category for the Australia Council, uh, and have that 12 months to plan um, uh, plan accordingly. It's going a bit funny here with my ability to move between the slides. Sorry. There we go. Um, just to quickly uh, touch on um, the heads of practice. Um, so there's the list of the different um, art forms uh, and arts practices under which um, these um, uh, expressions of interest will be reviewed. Um, so if you do have specific um, questions, um, please contact one of the heads of practice. Um, our art, art of services team also can take general inquiries uh, around this, and that's particularly um, around issues of technical issues around the application form, uh, other technical um, But certainly if you're wanting to have, I guess, a, a discussion around the context uh, with, of an application within a particular uh, arts practice area, uh, then I'd contact one of those heads of practice to, to sort of have that discussion um, as well. Um, so, um, what I might do is um, move to the Q&A, uh, and then there's just some information about how to contact us. Um, and let's just start to work through some of the questions. Uh, so the first question we've got Uh, is from Jessica, and it's about how funds will be distributed dis distributed uh, between art forms. I might ask um, one of my colleagues if they would like to um, take that one on, uh, and I can certainly um, provide um, some uh, background too. I can't see them, hang on, where have they gone? So Zoha or Sarah? I guess I'll take it. This is Zoha. Hi, everybody. <laughs> um, at this point, there actually hasn't been a specific allocation to individual art forms. There's a pool of money that we'll work towards distributing once we see where the EOIs end up. Um, so it isn't a matter of um, deciding which art form may or may not have the most funds allocated to it. We encourage everyone to try and believe that the art forms are as equitable as possible and um, we'll make the allocations once we get past that EOI stage. Thanks, Zohar. I think that's um, a kind of important point um, um, because it is uh, a fairly dynamic kind of process that we go through in terms of the review um, of the expressions of interest and then the applications towards the end of the process as well. So we don't, there's not a sort of a, a number in, in our heads in terms of that. And what we really do try and look at, I guess, is the, is the spread of applications across arts practice, the spread of applications across uh, a geographic uh, range of this, um, of this country, uh, and also then look at sort of particular areas of practice and particular communities uh, of interest as well when we're sort of making um, the decisions on, on the distribution of funding. So um, uh, it isn't really a case that we can say, you know, the budget for visual arts is going to be X. I um, hope that's answered the question, um, Jessica. You've also got a, another question in there, which is, will the Australia Council have a new strat plan launched in the period of application? That is, will the goalposts be changing mid-game? Great question. Um, I think I'll take it. Um, the, um, there will be a new uh, uh, corporate plan likely to be launched. Um, however, uh, it's not going to change the goalposts uh, mid-game. Um, and um, what 
um, I wish I could get back to that slide. Um, just on the criteria. Bear with me, folks, for a second. Um, because uh, when I just want to, uh, I just want to answer it by referring to the criteria. So the assessment criteria for expressions of interest are the quality of the artistic or cultural vision or achievements, which I've touched on a bit earlier. Um, organizational capacity, which is about the, your organization's track record of delivery and capacity to deliver on that vision. Uh, and the last one is alignment with the strategic objectives of the Australia Council. Um, and you'll see that we've listed those strategic objectives there. Um, and I guess the only thing I'd say about that is they are um, they are uh, very, I guess, broad broad objectives, um, and um, and I wouldn't anticipate there's going to be a, a I guess a significant shift in emphasis of those um, between the expression of interest and the um, and the full application. So I think um, um, I think if you sort of can if in the expression of interest, if you sort of respond to those. Uh, and I guess the other layer of that too is, is that the national cultural policy will, will be announced before these expressions of interest come in as well. Uh, and I guess that's another, another layer of that. But again, we don't think that these things are going to be in, um, uh, in conflict with each other. Um, and I think you can be pretty assured that if you sort of um, uh, present an expression of interest sort of um, where those particular objectives meet, what your organisation is doing, um, you'll, you'll be able to present a, um, a good case uh, under that particular criterion in the application. Anything to add, Sarah or Zohan? Trish? Oh. Right. Um, okay. Um, it's being not for profit and eligibility criteria. That's a question from Kath. Um, thanks for that question. Um, no, being a not-for-profit isn't an eligibility criteria. Uh, so it is possible that we um, would fund uh, organisations that are for profit. Um, but I guess we want to be sure when we're looking at those sorts of proposals um, that our investment uh, is not going um, into, uh, I guess, the... the um, the profit of the company, if you if you, if you if that makes sense, that that it's a sort of a, a, a balanced budget that we're seeing uh, in terms of how our funding is expended, uh, and in terms of the activities that it's able to support for that particular company. Um, the um, next question is from Cressida, and it's around. Does opera fit within music or multi-arts as it combines music and theatre? Um, it's, um, it's a good question. I, um, I think that uh, opera fits within music um, as a practice uh, and would encourage you if you are um, planning on uh, making an application uh, for opera that you speak with Kirsty Rivers, our head of practice of music, uh, and just really talk around uh, around um, around that uh, and that fit and um, the suitability for music, but I, you know, my view is that yes, it would sit more firmly within music than than uh, within multi arts. Uh, Julie's asked a question, which is, can applications address more than one head of practice, e.g., community arts and dance? So, Sarah, perhaps I'll ask you to answer this one. Um, I will get you to clarify, Andy, about the um, ability for applicants to submit to two different panels. Um, but I, I've noticed that there are a number of questions that seem to sort of be skirting around the idea of what multi-arts is and when you should apply to multi-arts. Um, ideally, multi-arts um, comes in under uh, organisations that really do service equally more than one art form, um, where you feel like you have a, an equal or um, weighting across a number of art forms or even two art forms, then I think the natural um, the natural application 
um, should go to multi arts. Whereas I think um, if you feel like you're very much grounded, let's say in the dance world, and you uh, your application, you really want to have read by those industry advisors whose knowledge sits firmly in that area, then you would apply to dance. But um, I would encourage you to ring either the heads of practice um, or the uh, investment team to discuss where you think that should go, um, just so that you have some confidence when you're writing that you know it's the right place for you and your organisation. But Andy, can you talk about that application process to more than one panel, please? Well, it's possible. Um, it's possible through the expression of interest pro process, pardon me, <coughs> to apply um, to more than one uh, panel. Um, uh, uh, or sort of under one, or, or under one area of arts practice. Um, again, I think it would be really important if you're proposing to do that, that you speak to the relevant head of practice um, about that, and potentially in, in, in a, in a, um, a three-way conversation with them too. Um, and what, what, what generally will happen in those situations is that if, that if one of those or both of those <laughs> expressions of interest get through, for example, then we would we would then nominate which one uh, which uh, form area of practice the, the the full application would come to later in 2023, um, and that really is about us um, having the ability I suppose to again as I mentioned earlier to kind of balance across um, across the um, funding for the program uh, and where and where things are sitting within the program and and geographically etc cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, I think it, I think it's um, quite important if you do that though. Uh, that you're not submitting the same expression of interest to, to both panels, really, because you want to kind of emphasise um, the particular practice that you're um, submitting to. So it is, it is, it is um, a bit of extra work in that sense. Um, and that's why I would suggest it's really important to have that chat with the head of practice um, for each of those areas, or, uh, art form areas, um, to kind of really get an understanding of whether that's the right thing to do and whether you would be sort of competitive taking that approach within the expression of interest. Can I also add that um, we've done our best to refresh the definitions of the art forms that are available on the website. So if you're seeking some further clarity um, for discussion internally, you can come onto the website and kind of align yourself with whether or not, particularly for community art uh, practice, um, whether or not that resonates um, whether the actual form of practice resonates with the work that we, you and your organisation are making. Thanks, Soha. Uh, there's a few questions I can see now on the list just around the, 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 the funding levels for the program in its entirety. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, <clears throat> at this stage of the game, um, the funding levels will compare to the 2020 and uh, 2021 to 2024 funding cycle. So uh, we don't have any um, extra uh, funding at this point in time. Uh, and so we are uh, operating on the, um, on the basis that there isn't any extra funding coming into it, which of course means um, that it's going to be uh, extremely competitive. Um, and um, you know, and and when and when we get through the expression of interest process and that full application process, there will still be difficult decisions to make. And I guess I'd, I'd hasten to add, um, you know, e even if there was uh, um, an increase in funding, there would still and always be difficult decisions to make because, as we all know, there's a lot of really fantastic and creative organisations um, <clears throat> out there in the arts community and. Um, you know, um, constraints in our ability to support the activities of all of those organisations. Um, so at this point in time, um, there isn't um, additional funding available uh, for this program. The total pool of funding, uh, Amanda, um, uh, and Jack, I hope that sort of helped to answer your question, um, at this point in time is, as I said, similar to 21 to 24. So it's around about that 20, $28 million uh, mark. Um, and um, it's not like, and that is not uh, likely to change. Um, <clears throat> Ben's asked a question just about, um, is there an advantage if an organization covers a number of art forms, e.g. opera, music, visual arts, sometimes dance, community engagement, chorus? 
Um, then I think that that sort of um, feeds into what Sarah was talking about around multi arts. Uh, and so if there is a really uh, clear distribution across a range of art forms for an organisation, then we would encourage you to have a chat perhaps with Sarah uh, and just uh, get a sense of where you sit within the context of that uh, multi arts practice. Andy, can I just add to that, that it's um, probably a good idea to have a look at who the current um, four year funded multi-year organisations are, just to get a sense of the breadth of their practice. And um, it might help you to decide whether or not you feel like you fit into that same category. Thanks, Sarah. <clears throat> um, there's an, a question from uh, Anonymous um, around the EOI process and peer review. Um, what we're planning to do with this um, this round of for your investment is actually have um, uh, both expressions of interest uh, and applications through the full application reviewed by industry advisors. Um, so industry advisors are again experts in their field. Um, they're they're um, experts in the arts practice, experts in uh, organisations, and we'll bring them together um, to have <clears throat> a um, detailed discussion on both the expressions of interest. Uh, and the applications, uh, and they will then make recommendations through to the Australia Council about where, what they think are the ones with, um, um, you know, ones that, that are sort of priorities, ones that are sort of meeting the criteria to a high degree. Uh, so it's a process that will that will be similar to what we would use through a peer assessment process, um, but um, we're using industry advisors because. Uh, at the then sort of for the Australia Council, it gives us the ability to moderate uh, across the whole range of applications uh, in terms of um, you know what, what what things will be supported uh, at the end of the process, and that that's enables us then to sort of apply I guess a strategic um, prism across all of those things that I mentioned before around geogra geographics, um, art form, uh, communities of interest. Uh, all of those sorts of considerations when we're looking at uh, at the final list of um, organisations that will be supported. Um, another question from an anonymous participant. Um, does the organisation need a history of being successful with the OSCO grants to be viable for four year funding? Um, and can you also apply for project funding in 2023 in case the four year funding doesn't come through? Um, Soha? Um, my experience, no, you don't necessarily need to have a successful history of um, being funded by the Australia Council uh, to be eligible for, for your funding. However, you do need to show a history of um, success, um, growth, and a really clear vision about the progression of your company into that period of funding. So the 2025 into over the course of the next four years through the funding that you'll get allocated where you see the organisation going, which leans into that artistic vision that you put forward in the expression of interest. Um, so that would be my response, not necessarily a history of um, support from the Australia Council, but certainly a history of receiving funding and successfully moving forward and progressing as an organisation. And in terms of the project funding, absolutely, you can apply for project funding um, in 2023 in case the four year funding doesn't come through. And indeed, um, obviously, in 2024 uh, as well. Um, the next question is from Andrew. Can you give us an indication of what proportion of BOIs are expected to be successful to the next stage and what proportion of full applications and what is the value of funds to be allocated? I've touched on the value of funds. Um, in terms of the EOIs, that I guess is kind of dependent on how many EOIs we get. Um, but um, our, our, our approach to this two stages of applications is so that, um, um, so that you don't need to put quite as much work into the EOIs, although I do know that a lot of people put a lot of effort into them. Um, but it is, uh, you know, as I said, we don't need the, all of the finalised strategic plan, all of that sort of work done by, by February. Um, um, but uh, I guess the point we want to get to is, is really having a much higher proportion uh, of applications successful through that full application stage. 
um, because we really don't want to put people through from a from the EOI stage to the full application stage um, if we if you know if there really is going to be a lower chance of success. Um, so we're very conscious of the fact that um, we don't um, we don't want to get to that last part of the process uh, and and really have, have have had a lot of people go through um, putting a lot of effort into it and then not being um, not being approved for funding. Um, so it's a it's a it's a um, it's a tricky balance, but um, that's kind of the principles that we work with. So I can't really give you a kind of a a, um, a a figure in terms of a proportion because it will depend on the number of applications we receive um, um, for the EOI process. Uh, Pillar had a question about multi arts, which I think we have probably covered. Um, oh, in fact, well, it just talk, it it talks about service organisations, and so I think it's just worth touching on. Um, we are approaching um, the, the multi-year support of, of services for artists in a slightly different way uh, this time round, uh, and we will be putting some information up on the website, um, hopefully sooner rather than later, about a, a stream of uh, funding under multi-year called Delivery Partners, uh, and that's where we actually um, have made a, a change, I guess, to the, the way things are assessed through the uh, four-year investment expressions of interest, in that we are looking purely at artistic programs uh, under four-year investment. And so all organisations that come into uh, put in a four-year investment expression of interest need to sort of uh, sort of articulate an artistic vision uh, and, and, a, and I guess a, a, an approach to artistic programming. Um, organisations that purely provide purely uh, services to the sector uh, we will look at um, through uh, this uh, other stream of delivery partners uh, and we, uh, through the, commu the communications around the four-year investment, have um, been talking to a number of organisations that we currently fund as service organisations, um, but we're certainly happy to have that conversation uh, with organisations uh, that think they fall into that service area. Um, um, because it's quite a nuanced kind of discussion. There's certainly, uh, we don't want to give the impression that organisations that, that come in with an artistic program to four-year investment don't provide services also uh, as part of their activities. Uh, so it's quite a nuanced discussion. So Pilar, I'd encourage you to sort of talk to um, one of the heads of practice uh, or me uh, to, to sort of just unpack some of that a little bit in terms of uh, what the best approach might be. Um, Fiona's asked, where would visual arts festivals fit into the funding? Is there specific funding for arts organisations that present festivals or, be, uh, or by biennales? Yeah, Trish? Do you want me to take this one? Yeah. Um, thanks for the question. I think uh, we don't have sort of specific funding for festivals, but I would recommend that you have a chat with Michaela, our head of visual arts, um, because it'd be good to sort of chat through uh, the sort of vision of uh, your festival and um, yeah how you would sort of apply to the visual arts panel um, for that festival so yeah have a have a uh, reach out to Michaela uh, who's our head of visual arts um, for this one thanks thanks Trish uh, there's a question from another anonymous attendee if you are specifically a company that makes live performance what other streams of income from a small company Sarah. I'm sorry, can you just repeat the end of that? I just yep. cut out. If you're <laughs> specifically a company that makes live performance, what other streams of income would you expect to see for a small company? Well, that diversification of income is really um, as creative, perhaps, as your creative practice. Um, the, the sorts of income that we would be looking at uh, are perhaps from um, other levels of government um, to, you know, relationships with your state and um, local councils. Um, income from generated from performances, income generated from the actual core business of your organisation, um, but really it's um, it's it's really a criteria that is about ensuring that the the funding, the four year funding that you're applying for, isn't the only source of income into the organisation. Thanks, Sarah. Um, <clears throat> the next question is from Kath. 
uh, which is, will the fact the impact of the pandemic has been felt disproportionately across the country be reflected in any of the processes or decision-making in this round? I might ask Zoha to, um, to talk to that one. Sure, thanks for the question, Kath. Um, and in an acknowledgement of how tough the last couple of years have been and that the crisis, the COVID crisis that we were existing and living through over the last two years has somewhat morphed into um, a suite of other kind of crises. Um, but I think we can recognise that you're quite right. It has been felt differently across the continent um, and the experiences that our colleagues and our communities have been um, living through and navigating their way through are very different. Um, I don't believe that that lived experience of the last two years is necessarily going to come into hand around um, whether that will come into the decision making of the EOI round. However, there is a really integral question that is being asked of the organisations who are applying um, and a, a conversation that needs to be had within your own organisation and with your boards. And the question is really around reflecting on the continuous challenges that we're facing within our operations over the period of this funding round, so 2025 onwards. And over that new operating period, um, how are you going to be responding? Um, what are the changes that you're going to be making and seeking and um, navigating your way through? Uh, and that's a really great opportunity for us to have a future focused conversation beyond um, what's come before, but really look at what's coming up um, and how do we navigate our way forward. Um, and it's also to the point that Annie made earlier, an opportunity for each organisation to really express their progression over that period of time um, and talk about where we might start in 2025 will not be how we start the following decade in 2030. Um, so I hope that answers the question. Thanks, so can I just also add to that, um, Kath and, and anyone else, that that actually also applies to organisations that are being affected by the floods and fires, because we are um, obviously aware that, that those impacts were also felt differently in different areas of the continent. So um, likewise, it's just um, the, the progression is really the, the key thing, as, as Oha has said. Thanks, Sarah. Um, Wes has asked a question, uh, hi Wes has asked a question about leveraging other funds uh, and whatever happened to the old harmonised funding reporting arrangements from the Australia Council and state governments. Um, there appears to be nothing harmonised about the current arrangements. Um, <clears throat> I can't disagree with that Wes. Um, that still remains um, a bit of a challenge. Um, there's certainly a lot, there's certainly more harmony, I think, between, um, between uh, the partnership framework organisations in terms of reporting with state and territory governments. And it's still the aspiration that that, um, that gets better with, with the uh, four-year investment organisations. Um, I think things are improving, but I can't really put my hand on my heart and say that things are, are harmonised in terms of reporting arrangements. Um, but I also think the... The, the reference to leveraging of other funds is, like, I guess, is more about what the Australia Council investment can do um, for your organisation in, in, in the potential for you to be able to leverage other funds with that kind of, I guess, continuing support. Um, so I'd really encourage you to think um, uh, about uh, where that, what, what, what capacity the organisation might have if it does have for your investment to leverage other funds from other sources. Um, and it goes back to sort of Sarah's answer a little bit earlier about um, what sort of other supports expected. I mean, it, it really is about um, where how how creative the organisation and and the boards can be in terms of in terms of what connections they can make into their local communities uh, and into their jurisdictions in terms of finding those other sources of funding. Um, Cindy has also asked. Can you give an example of what you consider as a compelling four-year artistic vision? Um, who'd like to have? Who'd like to tackle that? I know I have a bit of a sense of what a compelling four-year vision looks like. Shall I go? Yes, they're all nodding. Um, I think I, for me, the compelling four-year artistic vision is. 
um, I guess setting up setting up why the organisation exists, what it wants to what it wants to achieve artistically, and that and and what it wants to achieve artistically can be across a very broad range of activity. So. Um, you know, we sort of talk about uh, we sort of talk about artistic quality. Um, we sort of talk about artistic ambition, um, and I think there's there's a sense that what we're looking for in terms of an uh, in terms of a four year artistic vision is a journey and story over those four years. So it's not about saying what the artistic vision is going to be in 2025. It's actually talking about what trajectory what trajectory the organisation is on over those four years. <clears throat> Um, but, but, but the artistic vision itself really comes down to the activity of the organisation. And it's not as though we look at them all um, through one particular lens. I mean, there's a whole range of um, uh, arts practices that we support. There's a whole range of arts activities that's supported. Uh, there's <clears throat> um, uh, and a whole range of, I guess, uh, engagement with organisations from community arts and cultural development um, experimental arts through to through to you know theatre uh, performance and and you know and uh, musicals opera. So, um, in terms of sort of describing what a compelling artistic vision looks like, I think we can only kind of talk, talk about it, that in the context of of kind of how you present that how you present that journey over the four years. Um, in terms of the artistic ambition and the artistic ideas, that's really up to the organisation and. And, the, and 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 your board to kind of think about those and uh, and present them in a um, in a really articulate and clear way. Uh, and I guess the other thing I'd say is plain English is always the best um, and really keep it, you know, kind of keep it simple and straightforward um, rather than getting too um, too overloaded with theoretical or um, or sometimes impenetrable language. Is that a decent summary, colleagues? Okay. Um, Helenka has asked, uh, as a new as a new two year organisation based in its east, east Gippsland, is this going to be difficult in terms of proving our worth in history? Given we don't have lots of documentation as yet. Um, hopefully not, Helenka. Um, we do ask um, for some financial history, uh, particularly in the uh, in the expression of interest. So if you've got questions about that, please get in touch with us and we can talk that through. Um, there are obviously ways that we can we can deal with deal with things. Uh, and so it's probably best just to have a have a um, direct conversation with us. If you're in that position of being a very new organization about what might be the best uh, kind of things to submit. Um, Alana has asked a question about uh, if we know what's happening with the final batch of rise funding that was announced by the previous government. Is there a possibility that this money will be rolled into the four year funding pool? Um, I think I fall back onto the earlier comment I made is that we don't really have any information on that at this stage. Uh, and so we're kind of operating um, within, the, within the context that the, the funding pool remains the same. Uh, Spencer has asked, if you're making a physical performance that includes circus, AV, live music and text, would you still recommend the theatre category? I think we would. Um, and so, yes, have a, have a chat uh, to Annette Madden, our um, head of theatre, um, to talk through the context for your particular uh, activities in that area, Spencer. Kerry ann has asked, where would creative industries fit? I, I guess it depends what I guess what you're sort of talking about you're talking about uh, that could that could sort of span from music to fashion to technology so I guess uh, it would really sort of depend on what um, yeah I guess art um, form you're sort of talking about and then um, if you can sort of drill it down then talk to the relevant uh, head of practice. Uh, so, for example, if it was fashion, um, you know, you'd talk to Michaela Tai, head of head of visual arts. Um, at the moment, I think uh, there are some discussions around creative industries. Uh, so there could be potential for 
organizations that do work in that space uh, to be funded. Obviously music um, does uh, have activity that falls in the creative industries space. Uh, so also if it was a, a sort of music organization, have a chat with our head of music, Kirsty uh, Rivers. Thanks, Trish. Um, Zoe has asked, can you explain the process from EOI to application? In particular, is there feedback offered on the EOI submission? Following this, can we shift our financial ask from EOI to the application to take on this feedback? Um, uh, the answer to that is yes. If, if your uh, EOI um, gets through that first stage, uh, then yes, we'll be in touch with you to talk about um, the quantum of um, investment that um, we're willing to make in the organisation. Um, and that may be different from, from what you've requested through that expression of interest. Um, and um, and also, um, also when we get to that full application stage, that, might, that may be the case as well. Um, so we will certainly um, provide you uh, with some guidance if you um, uh, are approved through the expression of interest stage um, as to what you can apply for in the in the full application and obviously um, you know organizations will need to think about if they need to kind of uh, kind of rescale activities or or rescale kind of what their um, original uh, expression of interest was kind of proposing uh, when they get to that second stage as well um, now we've got 41 open questions and we've got 10 minutes I don't reckon we're going to get through 41 questions uh, in 10 minutes. Um, but what we will do is um, we'll look through uh, all of those questions and um, uh, and those that are in common will build into our into our frequently asked questions on the website. Um, and we will certainly um, um, try and get back in touch if you've left us with a with, with a contact we'll try and get back in touch with you too um, to follow up on the question as well. So I'll just keep working my um, way through them. Um, and hopefully you're all finding this useful. I'm not actually monitoring the chat, so um, I, I'm not sure if people are finding this useful or not, but hopefully you are. Uh, and as I said, there'll be further webinars um, over the next few weeks as well. So um, we're really thrilled with the um, response uh, today. And um, obviously we'll um, try and schedule some more in as well over the coming weeks. Um, Alana's asked a question, which is really just more of a comment really about the uh, concern about commercial organisations are eligible to apply for government support. That um, actually isn't a change um, for this uh, particular round of four-year investment. Uh, and I guess Alana is a bit of an acknowledgement that different art forms operate in different, in different ways. Um, <clears throat> uh, and so um, there's, there's sort of, that, that's the reason why really, that we don't really say it's just for, for not-for-profit organisations. Uh, there's just an acknowledgement that there are some uh, areas of um, arts practice that operate in, in very different ways across the, across the spectrum. Um, Anonymous has asked, if a company has gone on hiatus during the pandemic, will you consider the work it produced pre-pandemic as indicative of its output, or will a break in production be a what, disqualifying factor? Great question, Sarah. Sorry, I'm, I'm trying to follow the questions online. I keep missing them. <laughs> so, um, so the question is, if you've been on hiatus during the pandemic, look, I, I think, yes, that within council, there is a, a, a deep understanding of the stress that organisations have been put under in the last couple of years. And I think going back to some of the previous answers um, regarding whether or not you included uh, a sort of narrative about that within your application, we are very interested in what you want to do in the future. And, and you can use um, support material from previous works to support that application, but um, it's really a, a future focused application. So we just are interested in where you want to go in, rather than um, sort of really deeply investigating uh, why you may have had to take a break. I think there's an implicit understanding of the difficulty that organisations have been under. Thanks, Sarah. I'll also just add, we have actually also made sure in the, um, in the form that we do go back in terms of, in terms of sort of talking about the activities of the organisation to pre-pandemic. Um, so we're not, um, I think if you remember the last EOI, if you, if you made one of those, we sort of said, what have you done in the last, um, three years, I think we've just we've extended it back a little bit so it captures sort of 
um, 2018-2019 activity, um, which was before the, um, before the pandemic too. Um, Kate's asked, is there any further information for organisations applying as delivery partners, previously service organisations? Uh, as I mentioned, there will be more detail on that um, uh, on our website shortly. Um, but if you do have um, some questions, please uh, either contact me or one of the heads of practice and we can talk through uh, with you where we're at with that. Um, Kat has asked if we will take into account the portfolio of organisations and locations to ensure a balance of art form support in the decisions, or is it really just best EOIs go in no matter the share across art form and location? <clears throat> I think I've sort of said earlier that we do and we will try and take that strategic overview in terms of, in terms of how we um, look at the review of the um, expressions of interest. So um, it not necessarily is just the best EOIs that, that, that um, get up, that we will look across art form, we will look across communities of interest, we will look across geographically to try and do our best. But, but please be aware um, that we're sort of constrained um, by the, the funding that we have for the, for the category. And so we're not going to be able to, um, I guess, get to a point where we have sort of, you know, are, are completely satisfied with how we're sort of supporting uh, the ecology of practice across the country. Um, and that's just by virtue of, of the fact that, there, that, that, that there's um, constraints in the, in the funding. Um, but we'll do our best to sort of try and find that mix um, across, uh, across the country. Um, St. Martin's has asked us a question. It's, uh, thank you, it's great to talk to you. I hope you're enjoying the session. Um, what is the, the estimation of the number of hours an organisation might need to put into the EOIs? or full at, our full application from past experiences, weeks and weeks of work across the entirety of our small team and board. We are very conscious the AI is due very close to the return from summer break for small companies that have given all this year and are exhausted. This important opportunity seems to have suddenly snuck up on us in our schedule. Is there a reason for this and has thought gone into the February 14th deadline in terms of well-being of arts workers? Thank you. Um, Zoha, perhaps you'd like to address this one. Thanks, Nadja, and um, definitely this resonates really deeply with me and the team internally at Australia Council. We've had lengthy discussions about um, the pressure that this process puts on the team. I certainly have gone through it myself. It is a big task um, and it is a lot of energy, particularly if done right by both executive team and board. Um, and uh, certainly the deadlines and timeframes have absolutely um, been rigorously explored. Unfortunately, when you look at the end date and you work your way backwards, that's kind of where we find ourselves, which is that it's incredibly important to give the organisations that period of time of knowing where they move forward next and where the financial years fall. Unfortunately, that's just a Tetris um, puzzle pieces of pulling all together. Um, but I do think that um, for what it's worth, and sometimes words just simply aren't enough, there is a deep, deep understanding of the pressures that's being put on to the sector at the moment, which Andy brought up. Um, and where possible, please lean on your heads of practice, the artist services team. Um, earlier, I mentioned a couple of key questions that could be taken to the board for some of those energetic conversations. And often it's hard to also find that energy in the room. And one of them is around um, not necessarily the artistic vision, but certainly that conversation of progression and where are we going to go 2025 to 2028. Um, Happy to chat offline to anyone who falls in and under those art forms, but also if anyone else would like to just simply reach out. But um, there are, it is a tough time. And yes, that is a summer period. Um, there's lots of time at the moment where we can um, strategize about how to make use of the end of the year, but absolutely aware that it's not a perfect solve. Um, but we will do our best to support all of those organisations who are going to go through that process to make it as simple and as strategic as possible. Thanks, Zoha. Um, Bridget asked a question about, would the funding support infrastructure to deliver arts, for example, lighting systems within an art gallery? Um, <clears throat> I guess, generally speaking, um, the funding that we provide through For You Investment is, is, is about 
uh, sort of the uh, about the operations of an organisation, about the artistic program, and really is about sort of supporting uh, artists and arts workers to create to create that work. So I guess all of all of this is sort of is considered on balance. And I suppose um, if you know eighty percent of your budget was the installation of a lighting system. Um, you know, within a particular year with the four-year investment, then it would not be really a competitive, um, a competitive proposal in that sense. So um, it comes back to that to that diversification of funding and uh, and the ability to um, to find different sources of funding for the different activities of the organisation. But certainly, you know, we're looking at the four-year investment as um, as funding the uh, as funding the human capital. Uh, and within an organisation, uh, and some and some of the sort of the the operational costs of an organisation, uh, rather than um, weighting it too much towards infrastructure. Um, there's a couple of minutes left. Left. I haven't um, had a um, chance to forward glance through the questions. Is there any that anyone else has sort of noted, or should I just keep ploughing on? Discussion around national remit and um, importance of national significance. Uh, okay, so Hannah, um, who um, is one of my team members, has just mentioned that there's a bit of a discussion around or questions around, I guess, national national focus and national remit in terms of in terms of an organisation. Um, and I guess um, I guess the important point around that is that an organisation doesn't necessarily have to have a national uh, a national footprint, if you like, um, but but I suppose it needs to be um, it needs to have some sort of influence either within its region, uh, within its state or territory, uh, or nationally in terms of uh, in terms of the in terms of the art that it's making and in terms of the um, I guess the recognition of that organisation's contribution. Um, Zoha Rosera, do you have a perspective on this? Not, not, not necessarily, but, you know, I think it's probably worth pointing out that, you know, we do, um, as part of the four year investment, do invest into community organisations and the expectation there would not necessarily be that they serve the whole of the country in any way, but that they are really focused on their community or um, the organ, uh, sorry, the, you know, the, it could be local or, or whatever. So it, it really depends on um, I think what the uh, core work of your organisation is and what its internal remit is. Thanks, Sarah. Just to extend on that, I think as part of that aspirational work around what your artistic vision is, redefining what success looks like. So being able to simply, as Sarah said, to extend on that, defining what national significance looks like within your own context and that being okay. Uh, based on the resources that you have within your organisation and the partnerships that you're able to bring to strengthen and amplify the practice that you do. Great, thanks, Zoha. Um, we've hit uh, 2pm, um, but I think um, we can all keep going for a few more minutes, it's, perhaps. It's one, um, Trish. From Michelle Carl at 137 about eligibility of First Nations arts being delivered by non First Nations laws. Um, I might just deal with this one. <coughs> uh, so it's a, from Anonymous. I'm a very young African Australian theatre and storytelling company based in Adelaide. Hosting our very first major production this year, our vision of 25 and beyond is artistically bold and exciting. Are we eligible to apply considering we do not have a track record as such? Um, I sort of think we've we touched a little bit that on the question um, from East Gippsland as well. Um, I'd encourage you to um, to speak uh, probably to Annette Madden and get a bit of a, a feeling from her uh, about where the, where your company is uh, in its uh, in its uh, trajectory, uh, and 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 get a bit of a steer from Annette uh, about uh, how you might fare in the in the um, in the expressions of interest. Um, Oops, let's keep jumping around these questions. Uh, I think, Kylie, we've sort of talk, talked around that question too, which is about um, the funding levels um, 
um, to apply for through if your organisation gets through the EOI. So yes, we will sort of talk to you around funding levels um, after that process. Jane has asked, we are auspice. Can our auspice organisation apply on our behalf if they are also applying on their own behalf? Or can it be part of their application? <coughs> Pardon me. Um, in that instance, um, if you are not a legally constituted organisation, you can't apply through for our four-year investment um, funding. Um, so I would suggest if they or if this if your auspice organisation is applying that um, uh, and it's um, practical, <coughs> they build uh, the work that you're doing uh, as part of that uh, activity for their expression of interest. Um, Stephen has asked, could some of this funding be used to upgrade facilities infrastructure? I think we've I've touched on that really in terms of that balance of, of what the for you investment um, uh, funding is uh, there to support. Do you want me to answer the... Yeah. First Nations question. Sure. Thanks, Trish. To I think it was is it Michelle? Thanks, Michelle, for that question. Um, just in terms of the First Nations Arts and Cultural Panel, uh, we have we'll have First Nations uh, industry advisors who sit on this panel. Uh, this uh, panel is only open to First Nations organisations that have um, either fifty one percent or more First Nations representation. Uh, on their um, sort of board or governance structure um, and or their sort of key creatives. Uh, so that panel really only accepts um, those types of First Nations organisations uh, to apply just because, um, you know, we want to see sort of the First Nations uh, self-determined uh, practice and uh, the First Nations industry advisors, um, you know, also want to be assessing other First Nations organisations uh, from the sector. First Nations organisations can also choose to apply to the other to other arts practice areas. So, for example, some of our um, uh, theatre First Nations theatre companies uh, in the last four year funding round uh, applied to the theatre panel, for example. Uh, but it's really up to the organisation uh, to to decide. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Trish. Um, Andrew's asked a question, and I'll just answer very quickly, um, which is in reference to the um, the sort of rough broad budget for the for the category. That was twenty eight million per annum, Andrew, uh, not over the four years. <clears throat> um, we've kind of hit the uh, hit the end of the session, and we've still got quite a lot of questions. But as I mentioned, um, we will turn these questions into frequently asked questions if there are not already. Uh, answered within our frequently asked questions and try and get in touch with those um, that have um, that have asked questions. Um, and if you still, um, what I'd recommend too is if you still have the if you still have that question, um, please um, get in touch with us. There's uh, through our website. Uh, you can put, uh, lodge an online inquiry and you can just type your your question into that online inquiry, uh, and we'll distribute that around uh, to our team here to uh, to provide an answer for you as well. Um, as I mentioned, we're also offering um, some other webinars uh, over the next few weeks, so please um, keep your eye out for those. Uh, we will put them on our website and certainly highlight them under the uh, under the guidelines for four-year investment expressions of interest. Um, and um, um, and again, I would encourage you um, uh, also if you've got specific. Contextual questions around particular art form areas of practice um, to speak to our heads of practice uh, as well. So, look, thank you, everyone. We're really thrilled that um, um, so many of you attended the webinar today, and uh, and thank you also to those who've contributed questions because um, it really is the questions um, that help us uh, to articulate, um, you know, what we're looking for. And are really beneficial for other people then to sort of to sort of pick up on and understand um, um, some of the sort of the nuances and complexities of, of making the funding applications through for four year investment. I'd like to thank my colleagues on the panel today, Trish, Sarah, and Zoha. Thank you very much. Uh, and I'd like to um, also thank um, our Ausland interpreter, um, and um, uh, and also thanks to Diego and Hannah, um, who are our team here 
uh, council who helped with some of the coordination of this event. So keep your eye out for the next uh, webinar. I think it's November the 16th. Um, uh, and we'll, uh, given the, uh, given the um, fantastic participation today, we might sort of, um, sort of look at uh, a few other um, additional ones over coming weeks as well uh, to get through all those questions and concerns that you have about the program. So thanks once again, and um, we will um, uh, hear from you soon, no doubt. Thank you. See you all.